Good morning. This is Kelly Hobart from Alpaca Direct, and I'm here on Technique Tuesday. I'm happy to be here with all of you, and I hope you're doing well out there. We have a lot of snow that we got yesterday, and so driving is a little treacherous. So it's a great day, didn't it? But anyway, today I wanted to talk about what do you do if you have a pattern and you don't know where you're at, or if you have a pattern and it's not working out quite the way that you would expect. So those are the things I wanted to talk about today. Now, every week we have a prize, and this last week we had some sock yarn, and it's called Sasquatch, and we had two colorways. One is called Rose Garden, and the other one is called Naughty Lumberjack. The green one's Naughty Lumberjack, and that, that was the winner for this week, the winning color. So you see how pretty it is? And this is our sock yarn, it's called Sasquatch, and it has 80% superwash merino, 10% cashmere, and 10% nylon. So it's a great sock yarn. And you can make a pair of socks with just one skein, especially if you have small feet like me. Do you have questions <laughs> on how to pronounce the name of the yarn? So it's Coeur d'Alene. Oh, Coeur d'Alene, yes. Mm -hmm. We call it CDA yarns, but you can call it Coeur d'Alene. And it's really beautiful. If you haven't been here before, it's a great place to vacation. And if you live here, it's wonderful to live here in it. We love to live where we vacation. <laughs> so it's fantastic. But this is the yarn for this week, I'm this last week. And then for this week, I was thinking, what about some stitch markers? So since one of the things I'm gonna be talking about today is stitch markers, I wanted to show you our rainbow stitch markers and they come in um, large and small. And I love the rainbow colorways. There are 40 markers in each uh, package. And the colorways are really awesome because you can use like blue, for instance, for cables or green for your garter stitch or ribbing area. Maybe you use pink for the edge for a right-sided row, pink on the right-sided row. That's what I like to do with mine. And then I also thought maybe you guys might like the locking stitch markers. So you guys choose this week either two of these or one of these. And it's the locking stitch markers that are fantastic. And I used to use these a ton when I was a beginning knitter. I just like being able to clip it and unclip it. And so these locking stitch markers are fantastic too. So as we're going along, um, if you have any ideas that you, I haven't thought of, go ahead and post those in the comment section and let us know where you're from. If you have some great patterns that you're knitting, please share them with us because I can use them for future Technique Tuesdays and then uh, we can all learn from each other. And don't forget to post those projects. If you do, please um, give us the name of the pattern so that we know what the name of the pattern is and who the designer is so we can enjoy it. Because, you know, we get so excited about new projects. We might want to knit it, too. So don't forget to put that in the comments. And don't forget to share with buddy, your buddies so that they can learn, too. Because we all like to learn new things together. So this pattern this last week that I was working on is called um, James Cable Baby Shoes. <clears throat> and it's a great pattern. I had a little bit of a hard time getting gauge, and so I was doing, again, another swatch, and I made my cuff a little bit longer, and then I started using just a single strand of yarn because this uh, pattern called for a DK weight and two strands on a number three needle, and for me, it kind of turned into a ballistic armor. So maybe using sport weight would have been great, but um, I stopped here because the fabric that I was getting with a, a single strand was not quite as um, warm as I would have wanted because it, the, it's a little bit loose now. So um, anyway. Um, when we talk about that, remember you were <clears throat> going to talk about like when do you know when to stop versus the Right. That's right. So this was a paid for pattern. And a lot of people that are knitting paid for patterns, they'll, um, they'll decide, oh, I want to make it no matter what. And so they spend five million hours working on a pattern and they get done with it and go, mm, I don't really like it. <laughs> and so they take it all out. And so for me, when I pay for a pattern, okay, maybe it might be up to $8. I actually have paid up to $15 for a pattern, right, honey? And if the pattern is not working for you, 
and you've tried everything to make that pattern be the way that you thought it might be when you purchased the pattern, then um, you might want to think about cutting your losses, I think. Don't you think, Jim? Um, your time is money. And so when we're knitting along, just think of your time as money and um, that, that, that your time costs money too. And so if it's a $6 pattern or some valuable 40 hours of your time, um, it's less expensive to actually just let the pattern go or look for a pattern. You know what I'd like to do for beginning knitters, especially um, with patterns is find a designer where a lot of people use their patterns or find a designer that you like. And, you know, um, I remember Laura Ayler was a pattern uh, designer that I really liked when I first learned to knit because she, her instructions are so clear and they're so fantastic. And so what I did is I would just purchase her patterns. And so I was able to knit uh, quite a few different things from her work in uh, sweaters and because I could understand her knitting. So jumping around from designer to desi designer when you're a beginning knitter, is can be a little hard because everyone writes patterns a little differently and there's not like a, a standard for pattern writing per se and so anyway um sticking with a designer that you're familiar with it always helps um so what are you going to do with those little booties then what's your plan with the booties <sighs> for these little booties i really like the yarn and i am going to make some um some booties i i was thinking that maybe i might um for this particular yarn, I might use it for a different pattern that calls for actually DK weight and try this pattern in maybe two strands of fingering held together or something. So, cause my goal, you know, you think about the goals for the things that you really like when you make baby booties, for instance. And for me, I realized that for baby booties, I love a really nice cuff. So I wrote down the things that are, mm, not exactly negotiable. So I like a ribbed cuff on baby booties or baby socks. It I feel like it gives a lot of stretch for the cuff and it also allows it to stay up. And I um this pattern calls for elastic. Um I don't I didn't really want the elastic. And so that um that uh, you could take parts of the pattern that you like and then change it up a little bit and make it your own. It's totally fine. Um, another thing that I was thinking for baby booties is that always they must be soft and squishy because they're going on baby's feet, right? And so we don't, we want um, a yarn that's soft and not itchy. And we want a booty that the gauge and the actual fabric that you're creating when you're making the booty is, um, needs to be soft and uh, really squishy for the baby. And then, um, and then just the last thing that I wrote is if I didn't get the end result that I was looking for, don't be afraid to change patterns. <laughs> it's all good. It's not the end of the world. I mean, how many times have we wasted $6 on something that we didn't like and we threw in the closet? <laughs> Probably quite frequently, <laughs> unfortunately. So it's okay to do that if you find that it, the pattern's not working for you. But another thing that I was thinking about, because I had a ton of people where they are, they bring a pattern in, um, a project in that they're working on, and they're like, oh my, I have no idea where I am in the pattern. And so I thought I would go over a few things for you. So I have this little sample blanket here. So Jim, I'm gonna come around the table here. And this is my hugs and kisses baby blanket. First of all, I don't have the pattern anywhere in sight. Um, I don't really need it, but if you did need it and when you're working um, and you weren't sure where you were um, at in the pattern, um, having a stitch marker on the front that identifies the right side of your work is really a useful thing to do. So when you're knitting a project, um, identifying the front of your fabric is good. And placing this little locking stitch marker allows me to identify the front of the work. And I can keep moving it up if I want to so that I know um, the where the um, I am on my pattern. So this one right here, also, this is my working yarn. 
So I go to where my working yarn is and you can see that I'm three stitches from the end and I probably moved it there just because having three stitches on one needle and the rest of the stitches on the other needle, these would fall off. So I, I moved it over here, over to that side. And you can see I don't have this pattern on the edge marked, but I love using stitch markers. And right these bands that I have are just multicolored bands that I got from Sally's Beauty Supply because you can buy them by the 500 pack for like less than $2. And I, these are kind of nice for beginning knitters because if you get them caught in your work, you can just take a scissors and clip them and they'll easily come off. Where you can see, Jim, I'm gonna reach, if I had a metal stitch marker and I got it caught in my work, I would have to clip my yarn to get it off. <laughs> and that wouldn't be so good. Also, if you're not sure where you are in the pattern, maybe dropping a lifeline would work for you. So I threaded, if you're gonna drop a lifeline, and what a lifeline is, is basically a place marker for your work. So think of it as a bookmark for your pattern that you're knitting so that if, in fact, you chose the wrong row that you were knitting on, you could get back to this spot easily and not have a problem because what you would do is you would take this a strand of yarn that is um, at least one and a half times the width of your work, and then you would place it on a darning needle just like this. And then uh, the only thing you need to remember when you're placing a lifeline is that you're just threading the stitches onto this, the um, thread or yarn, whatever you're gonna use for your lifeline, making sure that um, when you get to where your stitch markers are, do not lock your stitch marker into place, especially if it's a metal stitch marker, because if you lock the metal stitch marker into place, then when you start knitting your rows, it's caught on this row where the <laughs> lifeline is. You know what I mean? <laughs> so you have to, uh, you would go around that stitch marker, not through the stitch marker, and just mark the actual stitches as a place marker. Because remember, you're gonna start knitting and then you want these markers to move up with you as you're going and not be locked in position by this scrap yarn that you put here. And so yeah, I would go all the way across when I'm doing my lifeline. And then I, when I say, oh, well, I'm on row three and I start knitting it and go, oops, I wasn't actually on row three. You can actually just take the needles off and go right back to this lifeline and be able to pick up your stitches um completely perfectly because the yarn is holding your spot like a bookmark and so that is how you would place a lifeline so um anyway now since i've identified that i have the front of my work because i have this locking stitch marker here um it, i know that i'm going to be on the right side of my work and then you say oh i have some cables here and a lot of people who are doing cables get really confused. They'll be cabling and they're like, where am I in my work, right? And so all you have to do is you have to look for where that hole was created by the cable. Do you see how I slid my finger in there and, looked and, and found the hole? And there's two strands of yarn. That means there was a cable row and then one more row after that right? So if I'm looking at my pattern here, this right here, this is an X. The reason why I know that is because the cable basically goes like this and the cable goes like that. That's an X. And then right above it, it goes like this and it goes like this. And guess what that is? That's an O, right? So if I am looking at this cable right here, we see that there's an X right here and then an O is developing. So if I'm looking at the O and I have this bottom cable right here and I know I have done another um, row after that, then the next row that I would be on is row number 21. So according to my pattern that I have, right here, I'm on row number 21. And do you see how easy that was for me to identify? 
because I stuck, simply stuck my finger right into the cable and I found two bars. And one, the first bar is made by the cable, moving your uh, stitches out of order to create that cable. And then one more bar has been knit after that. So 21 is where I'm at. And if you're not sure and you're a newer knitter, all you have to do is drop a lifeline Start at 21 and start knitting. And if for some reason it doesn't look right and you have to try and guess again, you can at least go back to your um, to your baseline where you were when you were knitting. So see how easy that is to find out where you are in your work is as simple as that. And then counting um, your bars in between the work tells you how many rows you've knit. Remember we were talking about the old maps when we used to print out MapQuest maps? Yes. And then we were, we were trying to find some place and there was no GPS. So then what did you always do? You always go back to at least the one road you knew, right? The one road that you knew and then continue following that MapQuest. I always carried that piece of paper in my hand and I, when I was driving, I'd put it right on my lap so that I would have uh, be able to read it easily. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad those days are gone because now my phone talks to me and says, turn right here. Although sometimes when it tells you to turn right, it tells you to turn right right before you need to turn right. And you're like, I wish you would have told me about five seconds earlier. It would have made my life easier, but it's okay. It's all good. I still like um, having our GPS on our phones. It's fantastic. Remember what you used to do when I first met you when you were little? What's that? When you were little? What's that? You didn't have roads where you lived. Oh, no, I just had one road. It was Highway 1. I lived up along the uh, ocean in Northern California. So I would get lost all the time. No, your the directions time. were always go by the rig, big red barn and turn to oh, the green road yeah. and there's an old car and then turn down that road. Oh, yeah. That was bad. That was really bad because one time, okay, so uh, we were going up to Annapolis and my sister had moved. And I, the only way I knew it was there was this big semi truck parked there with a double tractor and trailer. And then um, I didn't realize that they had moved that tractor and trailer <laughs> and we had gone like additional 30 miles or something <laughs> and before I went, no, that wasn't right. I didn't see the tractor and <laughs> trailer. Oh goodness. That was a bad way to try well, to figure out directions. That was Annapolis, Maryland either. That was Annapolis, California. California. Which oh, doesn't yeah. even have a grocery store. You know? Oh, yeah. It was up in the mountains. So you couldn't like stop at a gas station and ask for directions because there were no gas stations <laughs> <laughs> or stores or anything like that. It was just a road out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the good old days. Some things I don't miss. Um, no stitch markers. Yes. Oh, gosh. It's all good. Anyway, so, oh, and another thing that if you can't find, I had some things written down here and it said, um, what if you like the results you're getting, but you can't understand the pattern? And I wrote down here, you have several options. First, you can reread the entire pattern. Make sure you're not reading it late at night at like 10 o'clock at night because you get exhausted and you would be surprised at how many things you do not see or do not notice in the pattern. It's much better to reread the pattern early in the morning when you're bright eyed and bushy tailed. <laughs> it works a lot better that way. And then second, contact the designer, the person who wrote the pattern, because they know the pattern inside and out. And they may have um, a quick reply that can get you right back on track very easily, right? And um, that brings me to the point where sometimes uh, knitters will go, I'm sure the pattern's wrong. And I learned from hard lessons because I used to think that. And then... Um, I knit enough to realize that it's not always the pattern. It might be just the way that I'm reading it. It might just be, you know, some silly little thing that I've missed. And if I had been just a little more careful, I would have been able to discover the correct way to knit it and I would be on my way. And then the third thing that I was thinking about is don't forget to ask your fellow knitters because we have such fantastic knitters out there that are very willing to share. Don't you think, Jim? Mm -hmm. There's great knitters out VIP there. Group. And yes, VIP group, Ravelry groups, all different um, 
uh, forums, um, all different kinds of ways that you can get the answers to questions. I love using YouTube and YouTubing things and Googling. Um, oh gosh, the sky's the limit. It's endless, the possibilities of things that you can learn and discover just by asking a question. And with our internet the way it is now, it's pretty fantastic way to learn. So um, yeah. Um, How about errata? Errata? Yes, and don't forget to check if, there, um, if patterns have problems with them. The designer will have posted that straight away. As soon as they're discovered, they post it. And then you, so lots of times they will update the pattern, but sometimes they don't update the pattern. And then you would have to get the updates and print them out and add them to your pattern yourself. Right, Jim? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's always a good thing to keep in mind, too. And that's something to look at before you start knitting because there might be an error there and um, they posted it and found it. And and um, looking at projects on Ravelry of other people that have knitted or um, reviews on websites like Apaca Direct, they'll review the patterns and tell you uh, the ins and outs, the goods and um, maybe not as good um, things about it. And you can learn from them. So it's a great way to do that. Um, I, oh, I wanted to see who won this Sasquatch yarn from last week. <laughs> Jim, did you put a winner? Ah, Stephanie Benson. Stephanie, you won this wonderful sock yarn and it is the Naughty Lumberjack colorway. And see how pretty that is, Stephanie? Congratulations. All you have to do is get in contact with Apaca Direct and we get your shipping address and we can send it out in the mail to you. But this is beautiful sock yarn and it's called Sasquatch by a Cordeline Yarns. And it makes a pair of socks that is gorgeous. I've used this colorway several times and I really like it. The, uh, the local hand dyer that makes uh, hand dyes it for us is uh, she does a very good job of um, keeping the colorways consistent and beautiful looking. Um, so. Yeah, beautiful yarn. So Stephanie Benson, get in contact with us and you can have your lovely yarn in the mail. We can even send that out today if you call and get your address. And then for this next weekend, uh, this next week for all of you, either I should send these stitch markers out. What are they called? These are called our rainbow stitch markers and they come in size small and size large. And I, they're so handy. I love these um, stitch markers. Plus they're magnetic. And what I do with mine is I'll keep an, um, a couple of them on the edge of my computer and I just drop it on the corner of the computer and there's something magnetic in there. And the stitch markers go and stick right to it. <laughs> it's kind of cool. And so um, either these ones or the locking stitch markers, which are a lot of people um, use these. I know Michelle Hunter um, used to use these all the time when she was doing her um, knit alongs. And it's nice that you can take them on and off your project without um, having to worry about that. Yeah, totally fantastic. So you guys vote and I'll send that out in the mail. And I was thinking for this next week, um, I wanted to do... I'm thinking I'm going to do what's your point scarf and there's some things to discover about this project for next week and that's basically I wanted to look at some edgings. Okay. Yeah. Edges. Yes, edges. So how to make our finished um, work look beautiful with great edges. So I will be talking about that and I will see you next Tuesday. So all of you out there stay safe in the snow and I hope that you all stay warm. And I will see you soon.